Well, good morning, Mission Point. My name is Sepp Witherow. I'm one of the elders here. I'd like to welcome you uh, to our church. And I've got to tell you, I am really excited. And believe me, it's not about being up here. <laughs> I'm really excited because this week represents the end of the junior varsity teaching team, myself and all the other elders and the, and the guests. Um, we're going to take a look at chapter 22 today, and then next week we have the return of our senior pastor, Rich Axenberg, and he's going to close us out in chapters 23 and 24. That's going to be great. I am so excited to have Rich come and, and take the pulpit again. Now, let me see a show of hands. <clears throat> if anybody, like myself, is a fan of whodunits and murder mysteries, I love watching them on TV. I love seeing them in movies. I read the books. And they all pretty much start out the same, where somebody's killed. And uh, we see them lying there somewhere, and uh, you, know, the, you see the murder weapon, and then somebody else comes along, and they're walking to the room, and they're looking at the murder weapon, and, and they start to reach down for it. And us, you know, we shout out, don't touch the murder weapon. Yeah, we do that, don't we? We kind of think of television as an interactive thing, and we talk to the TV. Um, I do it with scary movies, you know. It's, person's walking down the hall and getting ready to go into a closet and we're like, don't go in that room, you know, or look behind you, can't you hear that music? You know, <laughs> you know we, we just do that. So this person reaches down and they grab the gun or the knife or whatever it was the murder weapon was. And inevitably, somebody walks in and sees them standing there with that in their hand. And now they're the ones who are in trouble. And what we have here is a situation that's kind of a theme with today's message is things are not always as they appear. Now, if I could get the map up here, just a real quick history lesson on what we're doing. If you look, right down the middle of the map is the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, okay? And to the left, that's the Western tribes of Israel. And to the right, that is called the eastern tribes of Israel. We have Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They're called the half-tribe, obviously, because they're split on both sides of the Jordan. Now, last week, we heard Rich talk about the allotment of the tribes and how they've all been given as it was in the Promised Land, and each tribe has taken their territory. And we still had three tribes that still had to go back home, and those are the tribes on the eastern side. Now, all the way back in the book of Numbers, leaders from these three, three tribes had come to Moses and asked them, listen, would it be possible for us to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan? Because these three tribes are much more involved in raising livestock and, and things along those natures. And the more northern mountainous regions on the eastern side or a much better thing for them to do, not to mention the amount of land there. You know, so they asked if, even though God had promised the western side of the Jordan as the promised land, if they would be able to stay on the eastern side because it would work much better for them and their livestock and everything else. And at, at first, Moses was very concerned about this. And he said, uh, I don't like this idea because if you stay on the eastern side and your, your brothers have to go on to the western side and still fight to take the promised land, um, one, they need your help, and two, they're going to be discouraged by seeing you already at home happy and starting your life. Uh, so the leaders of the eastern tribe said, well, look, we're going to leave our wives and children behind and we're going to cross over and we're going to fight until the promised land has been secured. We promise that we will do this, okay? And Moses said, fine, as long as you promise you can do this, then I promise that you can have that land. So that's basically where we're going to start today, where the western tribes have secured their land, and it's time for the eastern tribes to go back to theirs. First, let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I ask that today's lesson, the words of your, your message here, fall on fertile ground, that we're able to understand um, what it is you're trying to say. I thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to even come into this building and meet today. Uh, I thank you for this church and the people in it, and I just pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, first verse. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, and he said to them, You have done all that the Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but you have carried out the mission the Lord gave you. Now that the Lord, your God, has given them rest, as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But... Be careful to keep the commandments of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. To love your Lord, your God. To walk in obedience to him. To keep his commandments. To hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. So Joshua sends these men from the three tribes back to their homes. These men have been fighting with them. Uh, securing the promised land for seven years while their families have been back there. There's been a lot of sacrifice that has taken place with both the families and these men. Uh, Men have died, men have watched others die. He sends them off, and he sends them off with a blessing and a courage, I mean, a caution to continue to follow God. And the order in which he gives these warnings, this caution, is important. First, he tells them to love the Lord your God. And next he says to walk with him in obedience. And finally he tells them to keep his commandments, hearing the words of God, and serve him with all your heart. Now, conversely, Jesus also gave us our first commandment that encompasses all this. Jesus told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Now, if you mix up the order of these things, you could have problems. Uh, If you are hearing before or without loving, that could lead to heresy. And if you are obeying before loving, that leads to legalism. So off the tribes go, and they start heading back to the eastern side. And when they came to Giloth, near the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan and Galath, near the Jordan and the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. To war. Wow. The western tribes just went from DEFCON 5, restful peace in a hot bath, to DEFCON 1 troops poised to attack in the blink of an eye. And as crazy as it sounds, they are justified and should be commended for their readiness to uphold the word and the commandments of God, which clearly says there cannot be another altar of sacrifice other than the worship altar of sacrifice that's in Shiloh. They constructed their altar in Shiloh. Now, God's very clear He can only have one place of worship, one altar. Putting anything else anywhere else is an affront to God, and it commands that they react in the way they have. Now, I can tell you with absolute conviction that this was not an easy thing for these men to do. It was very hard for them to do. For years, they have battled together with these men. They are brothers in arms, okay? They battled through both sides to finally take the Jordan and the Promised Land. And they've been through enough things together that they have this unbelievable relationship. Now, if you've been here any length of time, um, you have probably heard me make reference to my time in the Marine Corps over the years. And I do that because my experience in the Marine Corps is probably the most significant thing that I could think about in my life in a lot of ways. 
I was a peacetime Marine, okay? I didn't go to war, but uh, the hellish three months of boot camp and uh, 24 hours a day with men training and preparing for war and, and living with them, you develop this incredible relationship and amazing loyalty to each other. And every Marine will tell you that there is no such thing as an ex-Marine. We are Marines for life, okay? It is literally the finest brotherhood of men that I've ever experienced in my life. And I can say that because I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if my dead body was lying in the middle of a battlefield, that every one of my brothers would risk his life to come drag me out of there and take me home because we don't leave anyone behind. This is peacetime. This is four years in comfort. These men fought together, lived together. They went through so much together for so many years. So for these men to gather for an act of war against their brothers in arms, it was an incredibly courageous act of obedience to the God that they love. And it was also probably the hardest thing that they have ever done personally in their lives. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, to Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With him they sent ten of the chief men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, each head of the family division among the Israelite clans. When they went to Gilead, to Reuben, to Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, the whole assembly of the Lord says, how could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us up to this very day? Did, have we not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord? Are you now turning away from the Lord? Well, first, let me say it's a good thing that they went and they decided to talk before actually engaging in war, okay? That's a really good thing, talk before war. But notice this is also very accusatory language. So they're not really getting the other side yet. And when they talk about Peor and the sin of Peor, this is something that... Uh, is really close to Phineas, the priest, the son of Eleanor. Back in the book of Numbers, there was a, a time period where the Israelite men had been seduced by the Moabite women, okay? And they started engaging in some of the worship practices of the Moabites and, and having relations with them. Uh, the Moabite god is a god named Baal, very nasty, uh, false god. Um, they have a, a really foul practice in that there's a statue of the god of Baal and his, his arms are either folded or hands out. And they would place this in a fire until it got cherry red. And then they would sacrifice a live baby in those hands as a sacrifice to Lord Baal. Um, God was so upset with the Israelites that they had gone and started doing this practice that he put a plague on their tribe, a plague that had killed 25,000 of them at the time that Phineas got involved. Now, Phineas was there as a priest, and he was trying to go assess the situation, and at one point he saw one of the men and one of the women um, getting ready to enter a tent. And in his zeal, he grabbed a spear and ran and ran that spear through both those people at the same time and killed them both. That sounds really violent, and it is. But God was so impressed with Phineas' zeal that he actually lifted the plague off of the Israelites and Phineas saved them from anything further. So Phineas knows that when something goes wrong with the tribe, God is going to punish the entire tribe. 
And that's why he's so upset, because he's experienced this already. And that's why his language is harsh. He goes on to say, if the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves other than the altar for the Lord. Now this, this is an excellent example of what it looks like when we confront and love and not anger. Because giving up land on the western side is a great sacrifice. I don't know if you remember that map, but the amount of land on the, on the eastern side was literally more than half of what was on the western side. So for them to bring them over there, all the tribes would have to come into smaller confined areas. They'd have to give up a lot. But they're willing to do that because they love these people. And they would rather have them do that than fall prey to going against God. It's a big sacrifice. And I wonder how often is it that we as Christians, we confront or advise change as long as it doesn't cost us anything. If we confront in love, we should be prepared to sacrifice in order to help. Just give you a, just an example of how that might look. A number of years ago, I had a niece come to me and ask me if I could officiate her wedding for her. Um, and I thought, great, I'd be honored to do it. I just have two conditions. He said, the first is, you're going to have to come every week with me, and we're going to go through a three-month-long premarital counseling class. And the second condition is, one of you has to move out of your apartment. You see, my niece had just started developing a relationship with God, and she was ready to get married, but she had also just purchased an apartment with her fiancé, and they were living together. And that couldn't stand. I wouldn't be able to marry them if they were starting their marriage off that way. Now, this really represented a hardship for them because they put all their money into their new apartment, furnishing it, and neither one of them could afford to move out. So uh, what happened is, in the end, my wife and I, we made room in our house, and for the next four months, my niece came to live with us until it was time for the wedding. Now, I'm not saying that to pat ourselves on the back. I'm, I'm giving this as an example of how we can command or, or confront somebody with something that's going to be a real hardship for them, and we should do everything we can to help them get beyond that hardship. Okay, so now the three tribes have a chance to respond to these accusations. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh replied to the head clans of Israel, the mighty one God, the Lord, the mighty one God, the Lord, he knows. And let Israel know, if this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord, to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, and to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us into account. No. We did it. We did it for fear that one day your descendants, your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you Reubenites and Gadites. You have no share in the Lord. So they're saying your descendants might one day cause us to stop fearing the Lord. That's why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you for the generations that follow, that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary and burnt offerings and fellowship offerings at his sanctuary, not ours. Sacrifices and burnt offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. Now, it's, 
it's kind of funny when I, I read that, something from my past viewing experience has come to me. It's Saturday Night Live. There was a, there was a comedy routine from the late great Gilda Radner, and a character she had was called Emily, or Emily Latilla. And what she would do is, it was like a point-counterpoint type thing, and she would get on there, and she would go on this rant, this rave about something you know, that was wrong for this and wrong for that, and halfway through it, you know, the, the people would say, you've got this completely wrong. You know, that's not what this is about at all, at which point she would look up to him and say, never mind. You know, it was, it was a hilarious routine. And that's just kind of the way I feel that Phineas is, is looking at this right now because he's came and he's done all these crazy accusations. And when he finally hears the explanation, it's like, ooh, never mind. So, and then continuing. And Phineas, son of Elazar, the priest said to Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, today we know the Lord is with us because you have not been unfaithful to the Lord in this manner. Now you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Ah, so there it is. Things are not always as they appear. Now was it a smart thing for them to build an altar without first talking it over the Western tribes? No, it wasn't. We understand the reasons for it, but look at the trouble that it caused. Should the Western tribes have given them the benefit of the doubt and assumed that there was probably an explanation? No, because they acted correctly in the eyes of the Lord. And assuming, or should we call it a suicide, is responsible for more problems than this world can handle. So let's look at just a few points of how we should handle troubling situations. Our first response should always be with concern to following God's holiness. And we should have the courage to always respond in love. We should always get the facts from the ones involved. Don't assume. And we should be prepared to sacrifice something in order to help. Now, in closing, I just want to remind you of the importance of promises. The Eastern tribes promised that they would not abandon the fight for the new land. Moses promised that he would give them their land. God promised that they would have rest at the end of the time of taking their land. And while God didn't promise Moses he would enter that promised land, he did promise them that he would see it fulfilled. And he fulfilled that promise supernaturally. He took Moses up to a high place where Moses, before Moses died, he could see all the land that was taken. He could see all the way to the sea. He could see all the way to the far lands up to the north and to the south. No man could see this with his own eyes. So God, in, in many ways, gave Moses a vision of the occupied land in the future and fulfilled his promise. A promise is our word, and it's said that we are only as good as our word, and God takes promises very seriously. His greatest promise ever is the promise that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that he was raised from the dead, we will have eternal life with him in heaven and not perish in hell. We are saved. He also promised a life filled with joy, but that is up to us. In some ways, many Christians are like mountain climbers. When they first started every climb, all they thought about was not falling, not dying. <laughs> but later on, they stopped thinking about that, and they could focus on the thrill of the climb. Many Christians made the decision to follow Christ because they feared going to hell. But if, you're, if years later, that's your only motivation, if that's where you still are, you are missing out on so much possible joy that comes from living and following Jesus Christ. Okay, Rich was talking earlier about the joy that this crazy woman over here, Gail, has. <laughs> and she is crazy. <laughs> but to, to just be around her, she is so infectious. She has so much joy for life and for the Lord and for these kids. It's unbelievable. 
And she didn't do that by just worrying about whether she's going to hell. She did that by developing a relationship with God. You know, Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I told you this, I have kept my Father's commands to remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy is complete. You see, we don't have to worry about falling off the mountain and landing in hell. Jesus told us, no one can snatch from my hands those that the Father has given me. Okay? We don't have to worry about hell. We don't have to worry about anything like that. Your climbing partner, your climbing partner is Jesus. So start climbing up that mountain so you can experience all the thrill and the joy that comes from the abundant life that Jesus has in store for you. I'm going to ask the band to come back up here. I'm going to close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the examples of confrontation and love and, and the proper way and the proper outcome, too, of how this situation was. We thank you for joy and the joy and the possible joy that we can have in our lives. Mostly, Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son, your only begotten son, to die for us so that we can have eternal life and not perish. Father, I pray for anyone here today that if they heard this and they have not yet come into you as your Lord and Savior, that they will ask you now. They ask you now to be a child of God, that they will accept you as their Lord and Savior, that they will say to you, Lord, I want you to be my Lord. I want to know you. I want to understand you. I want to give up the fear that I have in my life and the, and the desperation of the life that I live in right now. I want to understand the peace, the peace that only comes from knowing you. Lord, I don't know why you loved us this much, and I have a hard time accepting it myself sometimes. But I'm grateful that you did, Lord. So on this day, Lord, I ask you, please accept me as your adopted son and daughter. Please allow me to have you as my Lord and Savior. Allow me to understand who you are and follow you, not just out of fear, but follow you and, and know what it is to have joy in my life. I pray all this in the Son of our, name of our Son, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ.